everyone, and welcome to episode 14 of the Life in Norway show. I'm joined today by the co-host of one of the biggest true crime podcasts of the year, Death in Ice Valley. True crime podcasts have taken the world by storm over the last few years. But earlier this year, Norway, as one of the homes of Nordic Noir, finally got in on the act as well. Led by Norwegian journalist Marit Higraf and British BBC radio documentary maker Neil McCarthy, Death in Ice Valley aim to find the answers to one of Norway's most notorious unsolved crimes. I'm delighted to welcome Marit on the show to talk about the mysterious case of the East Dahl woman and whether the podcast helped to find any answers to the 47-year-old mystery. You can find out more information on today's show on the show notes page by going to our website at lifeinnorway.net slash podcast and looking for episode 14. Happy listening. I'm joined on the show today by Mare Tigraf, a investigative journalist from the Norwegian national broadcaster NRK and one of the people behind the hit podcast, Death in Ice Valley. Marit, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Not a problem at all. And I actually feel quite lucky that you've chosen to spend some time with us today because I've just been looking through your Twitter feed and see that the awards have been rolling in for Death in Ice Valley and that you can now count Sarah Jessica Parker amongst your your fans. Yes, yes, it's it's... It's amazing. Yeah, she's obviously a fan of our podcast and has been tweeting about it. Uh, the same goes for Alan Carr, in uh, a comedian in Great Britain, and lots of other people. So I'm really flattered, yes. Fantastic stuff. Okay, before we start talking about the podcast itself, let's dive into the topic of the show, which is the case of the East Dahl woman. Could you just explain a little bit around uh, the story and why uh, why this is such an interesting story to tell? The story about the East Dahl woman, it's a, it's a true, intriguing and, and very sad story. It's a mystery unsolved for almost half a century. A woman's body was found badly burnt in a remote valley in Norway in November 1970. Objects were found laid out around her body and labels have been removed from her clothes and items. And the police back then, they didn't manage to find her identity. And still, nobody knows who she was or what happened to her. What? Why was she in Norway and why did she die in that desolate valley? So is this a story that is fairly well known across Norway as being an, an unsolved case? Now it for sure is. It, it has been a pretty well-known case, at least in the, on the western side of Norway, mm. uh, in Bergen and then the west, western part of the country, since back then, since almost, uh, yeah, for almost 50 years but now with all this with all this uh, yeah publicity around our project here in NRK and then the the podcast together with the BBC so now it's a very well known case yes for sure also internationally okay so talking a bit about how you got involved then you're you're you obviously have a professional interest in in the case right now having made the podcast but when did you personally first find out about the case and then become interested in it well i was i mean i'm born in 1969 so i was one year old when this happened but i was an early newspaper reader as a child and i Actually, I remember reading something about the case uh, lo- very long time ago uh, mm-hmm. as a child because there were there has now and then there has been publicity around this case. It is a mysterious case. So, but then in my professional life, I mean, some years ago we we started speaking about making something. I'm an investigative journalist, as you said, and we we here in my unit we. Sp- started speaking about making something true crime uh, 
um, story. And uh, we dived, me and, and my team, we dived into different cases here in Norway. And, and this was for sure the most interesting one. I see. So the the podcast actually came out of this project. So the the idea wasn't specifically for the podcast. It was just a natural follow on from a set of reporting that you were you were doing already. This definitely started here in NRK because it started with I started working actively on this case actually two and a half years ago. So we had this as an ongoing project here in my unit in NRK. Um, yeah, actually, we started two and a half years ago. We have been publishing a lot of stories about the case. We have been investigating the case. And then um, one and a half years ago, the BBC took contact and, and wanted to do something together with us on this project. So the the purpose of this true crime investigative reporting is it's a sort of crowdsourcing, would it be fair to say, where you're presenting various pieces of evidence, interviews with people, and then hoping to actually come across new evidence or uh, new informants that can help solve the case? Or, or is that maybe uh, that's the optimum goal, but the reality is it's just telling some interesting stories? Oh, the reality is definitely we are for sure definitely trying to solve the case. Mm. So this is spoiling a bit to for those who haven't listened to the podcast. We haven't solved the case yet, mm. but we still work on it. And um, along the way, investigating, we are we are all the time. We have been revealing new things that hasn't been revealed before about this woman and 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 the story around this case. And uh, we try. To, to reach out there to that person or those persons who might know something about the case or this woman. We know for sure that this wasn't a Norwegian woman. She was definitely not. We don't, we're not sure where she came from, but we know that we need to reach out there to possibly reach that relative that might recognize something of the story and think, well, that might be my aunt. Um, we haven't, we still haven't, but the podcast is, the English podcast together with the BBC is definitely part of this reaching out there. And we, and in that part, we have a, a crowdsourcing element, uh, and it's highly interesting to follow. It's, it's a Facebook group where, where a lot of, I think it's it's almost 20,000 members now. A lot of people communicate together about the case. They discuss leads and, and theories and and they for sure come up with interesting things. So is that why the BBC were interested in becoming involved? They They saw that because this woman clearly wasn't Norwegian, they saw an opportunity to bring this case and this story to an international audience and in order to, to try and solve the case? Well, yes. Uh, but I mean, in bottom in there, it's it, it's it's the good story. It mm. always is for us journalists and, and media. We want to tell the, the, the good stories. And this is definitely a good story. But we are actually trying to solve it. And the BBC part of that is, yeah, it's mm. part of it. Mm -hmm. Well, not only is it a good story, Marit, it's a really good podcast and I have recommended it to several people already. And I think it's a nice introductory show for people who've never listened to a podcast before that might not know what a podcast is. Um, the, the very first episode, uh, the way you are walking through the woods in, in the outskirts of Bergen with the rain pouring down talking to some of the people. I think it was the police officer that was first on the scene, if I remember rightly. Yeah, uh, yeah. And you were actually there in person where it happened. It was incredibly powerful. And I actually listened to that first episode on a walk and it started raining whilst I was listening to it. <laughs> and I just carried on. I didn't want to go home. I had to listen to the whole episode. And of course, I binge watched, uh, binge listened, I should say, to the series, which I'm sure many people uh, can do now that the series is is all out there. But um, could you tell us a little bit about how you went about producing 
the podcast? What what was it you had in mind to create? First of all, thanks a lot. I'm, <laughs> I'm very happy that you liked our series. And yeah, uh, well, as I mentioned earlier, we in NRK, I mean, first of all, this this is a rare project to pretty big broadcasters uh, working together, collaborating about a series like this. This is this is very rare. I, I haven't heard of it before in, in this way. So it was, we had to find our way, I mean, NRK with the BBC. So our contribution from NRK side was pretty given. I mean, we, me and my colleagues uh, in the team, we had the story. We had done uh much investigation already we had revealed new facts about the woman and so that was mainly i mean research and and i of course i i had done i had found a lot of witnesses from back then i had already interviewed them in norwegian so yeah research and sources and the bbc took care of the the production that happened in London, the studio production and the production of the series. Storytelling and production, that was my colleague, co-host Neil's responsibility. Mm -hmm. Great stuff. Okay. So there are 10 episodes, is that correct? There are in, in this series 10 episodes, yes. And then, then we will maybe come back with new episodes if we manage to get on with the investigation. So is that very much dependent on if any new information comes to light from the first series plus everything else you've done before? If there's several new leads you can follow, then that justifies the creation of a second series? Yes, I think uh, we have got such a big audience out there now and they deserve that if we come back, we, we come back because we really have something new to tell them mm. about about um, our investigation and the woman. The investigation is ongoing. That is what I am working with at the moment. So, yeah, we we are positive and I have faith in that we will return with new information. Yes, I hope so. Good stuff. So this Making a True Crime podcast, with your role as an investigative journalist, how what sort of a relationship do you have with the police investigation? Um, I mean, in, in, in some countries, I think journalists and the police, you know, there's not a particularly good or, or, or friendly relationship there. Is, is it the same uh, with this situation or have the police been largely supportive of the project? Well, in this case, we we had no choice. We we had to, to seek some kind of collaboration with the police because the police own the investigation. But let me put it that way. The investigation happened a long time ago. That mm. was back in 1970s, a very old case. So it was pretty, it was no danger for the police in this case to be cooperative and to, to speak with me and with us about the case and, and to open their files, so to say, or actually the files they are so old, so they were they were at the state's archive in Bergen, and that's where we got permission to read them. Um, but then we, I, I don't want to spoil too much for those who want to listen to the of podcast. But we we have used our our investigation mainly is about new modern science, forensic science, and and to use modern forensic methods um, combined with with investigative journalism and for that we needed the help from the police but that was uh, I think good and interesting for both parts in this mm. project yes That's really it was a lot really to learn from it but for, from us and but also from the police sure that's really interesting stuff now the public response to the show, has, it's obviously been very good both in Norway and in the UK and I assume around the world as well. Uh, what sort of responses have you been getting? Is it more a case of, oh, you know, love the show, this is great, you should carry on? Or have there been any interesting suggestions for the case that have come in from the public without giving away any spoilers, of course? 
Oh, yes, I have to say both. I mean, mm. we surprisingly enough, uh, but the BBC World Service, they are really big. So it's maybe it isn't so such a surprise. But we have we have fans from all over the world. And we have obviously reached out there to listeners from from, yeah, Australia, New Zealand, uh, India, Bangladesh to Africa. So that's that's very interesting. And we have got a lot of leads suggestions from from listeners from both in the facebook group uh, there there is a lot of members there but that's actually i think half percentage of of the overall listeners um uh, they discuss the case the whole time and they give us clues and leads and what they and and they their theories but we also have got a lot of emails directly to our email account with, yeah, clues from, from listeners listening and, and making their theories. This is just fascinating stuff. Um, the true crime as a, as a genre is obviously super popular, especially with, with podcasts. But Scandinavian crime, uh, Nordic noir, whatever you want to call it, both in terms of written novels TV, movies, and so on is is hugely popular uh, around the world. But I think what a lot of people maybe don't realise is quite how popular crime as as a genre is in Norway, which is sort of ironic given that the crime rates are generally pretty low in Norway. But crime books just sell like wildfire. Um, what do you think it is about crime stories that uh, are so popular amongst Norwegians? Uh, I think crime is popular everywhere, not just in Norway. And, and for the time being, it looks like Scandinoir has something for for the people out there. It's it's very fascinating from from our in, for our international audience. Um, I don't know why, but there has been some very good years lately for for. Scandinavian drama production. You have The Bridge. You have uh, different series uh, have been sold uh, to other countries, and uh, we have been um, mentioned in the same sentence and as The Bridge and, and other pretty well-known Scandinavian productions, and that's an honor, of course. I mean, I think of myself. I've always loved good crime novels. I mean, it's a tradition in Norway that in the Easter time, we always read crime or mm. watch crime in television. It's a tradition. Um, yeah, I just think in general, people people love that. And it's something about the true story that give that extra dimension. You know, this has actually happened. It's true. Sure. So with you spending so much of your professional life writing, do you still get much time to to read and and if so uh, which norwegian crime authors would you uh, would you recommend i do read but in periods i don't because i have <laughs> so much on, in my in my professional life that i'm i go to bed exhausted and i i don't read a sentence so that i'm a period reader i would say and of course in my holidays then i always read yeah. And then I like to read crime, Norwegian crime writers. I would mention Yulnespa. That's the obvious one. Mm. I like yeah. his books. Something I've always found interesting with the Norwegian crime writers is so many of them, Yulnespa included, also write children's stories, um, which I just think is wonderful. Like it's that they're, they're, they're storytellers first and foremost, and they can turn their their hand to genres as different as crime and and children's stories. I can't really imagine two more opposite uh, genres. No, I agree on that. I don't see myself making uh, a a children's television program (laughs) at the moment. (laughs) It would be too difficult for me, I guess, as the... Uh, investigative journalist. Well, I, I do hear uh, on the grapevine that the next big thing in podcasting is podcasts for children. So um, you never know what could be around the corner. Uh, do you do you have a crime novel in you, Marit? Um, I don't think so. No, I have never thought about that. No, it's it's. I'm originally a TV journalist mm. and investigative journalist, so I've been working traditionally with television. Um, now I've um. 
I'm trying something new. I'm I'm trying the podcast genre. So uh, radio and yeah, I don't think I'm a crime novelist. No, I don't think so. <laughs> oh, I think that's a shame. Maybe we've planted a seed today and in a couple of years time, you can look back on this show as the uh, the reason why you're now a best-selling novelist. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, let's see. Speaking of journalism, uh, then, Marit, what what is it like working as a journalist here in Norway? Journalism is seen as a risky profession in in so much of the world. Um, I assume it's not quite uh, the same here in Norway. Can you can you tell us a bit about the environment for for journalism? Well, I I think most of us journalists in Norway we don't actually realize how lucky we are that we go to our jobs to work every day and we are we can be safe we are not in any danger in any way and first and foremost for the audience the listeners the the readers we can write and present the stories totally free of any influence from politicians or, or or governments i mean that's not obvious in all countries in the world and i i often i lived abroad eight years so I think you have to go abroad to come back home and see how lucky you are to do your profession here home because we have a truly free press in Norway and that's very good for Norwegian citizens Mm. good stuff whereabouts did you live I lived in Salzburg in Salisbury in Austria eight years fantastic Uh, was that Mm -hmm. uh, with NRK Oh, no, that was more uh, for private reasons that I, I went mm. there, but I did work there too, yeah. Oh, interesting stuff. Marit, this has been incredibly interesting. Thank you very much. Um, listeners can, of course, check out uh, Death in Ice Valley on uh, Apple Podcasts and all other podcast players. But before you go, I have some uh, standard questions that I ask all guests. Uh, These questions were originally designed for expats living in Norway, but I'm finding it really interesting to ask these to native Norwegians as well. So uh, quick answers, please, Marit. Uh, What is the best thing about living in Norway? That is that we are so um, safe. Living in Norway means that you are... You are safe in every way. There is, you mentioned it earlier yourself. It's we have a low criminal rate here, and you can walk the streets in Oslo, and you don't have to to fear anything. And yeah, interesting. Okay, what is the most challenging thing about living in Norway? I think I'm interested in this question, especially as you've lived in another country. The most challenging thing in Norway is definitely the climate. Mm. <laughs> in my opinion I, i'm thinking back to that first episode of the podcast with the pouring rain as you're, yes. as you're giving that answer <laughs> and the western part of norway it's it's really a challenge to live there with that weather it's it's not the rain in bergen it's pretty pretty hard as you can hear in our podcast series sure so when you say the weather are you talking about the rain or, or temperatures and snow and, and things like that as well yeah, well, you know, the, the the cold season is very long. I mean, I mm. live in Oslo and that's the the um, mildest climate you can find in Norway. We have a pretty long summer uh, and it can get very warm here and it's a dry climate. But I come from the northern part of Norway and that's pretty harsh, yes, mm. when it comes to climate. Okay, I think almost everyone who's answered that question, uh, if it's not the cost of living, then it's been the climate has been the answer. So interesting <laughs> stuff. Uh, finally, Marit, as you've lived overseas, it sounds as if you, you have a good knowledge of Norway as well, uh, coming from the north, living in Oslo and having recorded a podcast series set in Bergen. Where is your favourite place in Norway, whether that's uh, a city or you know, uh, uh, somewhere where you can stand for a, for a terrific view? I have many favourite places in Norway. Norway is a beautiful country, but I have one special place in my heart, and I have to mention that one. And it's not a place that anybody knows. It's the place where my cabin is, and it's up north 
uh, where the mountains are very high and steep and they go directly down in the fjords. And when I sit there on my um, cabin summertime and the midnight sun hangs out there in the fjord, well, then I'm home. I think you've sold that to all people listening to the show right now. That sounds fantastic. Marit, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Uh, I guess the best thing to do now is for people to go and check out Death in Ice Valley. Uh, Is there anywhere else people can go? Uh, Do you have your own website or is the podcast the best place? The podcast is a good place. You find it, as you said, in iTunes uh, or everywhere where you can download podcasts on the BBC World Service uh, webpage. And you also find it in the player in NRK. I would like to mention also that uh, I am pretty proud of showing the international audience a bit of Norway in our podcast. We're taking the listeners with us out in the field here in Norway and giving giving the international audience a piece of Norway, so to say. We try to tell a bit of, from Norway. So, yeah, possible to get an impression, at least. Great stuff. Marit, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. 